Amen. Now you veterans don't curl up with your blanket and go to sleep on me now. Amen. Do thank Barb for her hard work on that and um, appreciate that to say thank you and sure do miss Dale and uh, uh, thankful that we could recognize him as well during this time. So we have been in a series of messages these last uh, four Sundays on the abundant life, the life that we are supposed to have in Jesus Christ. Dwelling in Beulah Land is a song about the abundant life. Uh, John chapter 10, if you'll go there with me, we'll start out in John chapter 10 this morning. And uh, we're going to do a little quick review because it's important that, uh, that we not just be forgetful hearers. If we're going to live the abundant life, we've, we've got to know these things. Repetition is the key to learning, and so... Uh, each week we'll uh, review and um, take a look at the different aspects of the abundant life. But in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they, speaking of us, might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. We started out in the first Sunday that I, I started this series pointing out that the abundant life is not something that's guaranteed. In fact, eternal life is not something that's guaranteed. Only those who receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior make a decision to uh, believe that Christ has paid the penalty for their sin by dying on the cross and raising from the dead. Those have eternal life. The life that he's talking about that, that we might have, well, we do have it when we trust Christ as our Savior. And once we have that eternal life, whether or not we live it abundantly or more abundantly is entirely up to us. We decide that. It's not guaranteed that every believer is going to enjoy the Christian life. You have to make some choices. You have to take the resources and the blessings that God has given us with that life and put them into practice in your life, and that will bring forth the abundant Christian life. And so three weeks ago, we looked at the first ingredient in the abundant life, which is that of our adoption. In fact, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 1, we'll spend a little bit of time there in Ephesians chapter 1. We see that our adoption into the body of Christ, the family of God, is the first, uh, the first ingredient there. And, and if you look with me at verse 3 in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. These are the blessings that you get when you're saved. They're part of the life Jesus offers. And these blessings are there so that that life cannot just be uh, a life that you get through, but a life that you can live abundantly. It can be a, a life of joy. It can be a life of fulfillment. It can be a life of peace. And so what are these blessings that he's given us? In verse uh, 4, he says, according as he, that's Christ, hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and would be without blame before him in love, having predestined or predetermined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That adoption into the family of God it gives us a secure relationship to God, which cannot be broken. That adoption is permanent. It cannot be broken. Once you're saved, you're always saved because you've been adopted into the family of God and you are now a child of God. And the adoption teaches us that as we are now part of the family that we must depart from iniquity, put sin out of our life as, we, as the Lord works in our heart, as we see that, uh, that, uh, that sin crop, cropping up in our life. There's, there's a constant battle to the day we die where we have to keep making the choice to get away from the sin uh, because it, it, it wants us, it grabs on, it's not letting go. And even the Apostle Paul wrote about the constant battle between the flesh and the spirit that he had to fight, and he had to keep choosing to depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And so being a child of God teaches me that I should depart from iniquity. And that's really one of the first things you start working on as a new believer is getting sin and things that displease God out of your life. The second ingredient is that of acceptance. In uh, verse 6, he says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In Christ, I am accepted. I was rejected by God because of my sin. Now I am accepted by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It tears down the partition between you and God. Our acceptance 
tears down any division between us and God, and it teaches us that we have complete access to God. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As a believer, I have, a, I have access to God. He has accepted me because I've accepted Christ. In Christ, I'm accepted. I can go to him anytime I need something, anytime I need grace, anytime I need mercy, anytime I need him, I can cast all my care upon him because he cares for me. These are promises in Scripture, and what a, what a, what a more abundant life we would live if we spent more time in the presence of God uh, using the access that we have because we're accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ. The third ingredient we looked at last week is that of redemption. Verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption is, is where Christ ransomed or he bought us back. It's through Christ, the price for our sin has been paid, and so we can go free. We have We've been set free as, as saved people. Part of the eternal life is that we are no longer in the jail cell that sin had us in. We're no longer bound by the chains that, that held us back. Like if you know sign language, American sign language, the, the sign for being saved is this. It's the picture breaking the chains uh, so that you can be free. Uh, and, and that's what redemption means. It means that the price for our sin has been paid and we can go free. And redemption teaches us that we can leave our past behind and press forward with the Lord Jesus Christ. What holds a lot of believers back in their life is they're looking at past failures and they're looking at past sin, they're looking at past mistakes, and it's holding them back and it's causing them to, uh, you know, to think, well, God doesn't love me or God doesn't want me or God can't use me and all of those things, all those lies that Satan tells us, and they're just not true. The Bible says that he, God remembers our sin no more. When we got saved, he forgot him. He cast him in the depths of the deepest sea as far as the east is from the west. That's how far he separated his sin. And the Bible says he does not remember our sin anymore. You can, if God's left your past in the past, you can leave your past in the past. The only one who's interested in looking at your past is the devil. So just don't entertain that, all right? What a more abundant Christian life we'd all live if we forgot about our past. That we all have one. And aren't you glad God's forgotten about it? The next blessing, and the one we're going to look at this morning, uh, is one that we all wish we had sooner rather than later. How many of you wish you could go back in time and talk to yourself with the wisdom that you have today and talk to your younger self about something? And it, yeah, just pretty much everybody in the rest of you are lying, or you just don't remember anything about your youth at all. I don't know. Um, I was young once. I don't remember that. But the next ingredient here is in uh, verse 8 where he says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Well, I, I wish that I could, be, I could go back and be 25 again with the wisdom that I have now at 47. I, I wish I could go back to when I was 22 and first started pastoring a church and have the wisdom that I've gained over 25 years to start with. We know it doesn't work that way, does it? Wish it did. You know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, uh, as teenagers, we think our parents are stupid. And then, and then about the time we start having our own kids, we realize what geniuses they were the whole time. Because wisdom tends to come later. I mean, we don't even get our wisdom teeth until we're like 20. So, I mean, it just takes a while. But the word wisdom comes from the Greek word sophia, and it's where we get our word sophisticated from. It's one of the spiritual blessings we get when we get saved. The problem is, is like all the other spiritual blessings, you have it, but you have to use it. It's not automatic. You have to apply the redemption to your life and forget about your past when the devil brings it up. You have to apply the acceptance to your life and go to the presence of God when, you're, when you have a need. And even when you don't have a need, you should go to the presence of God. And you have to apply the adoption and say, I'm part of the family of God. I don't want to do anything that dishonors the family. You also have to apply the wisdom and the prudence you got. One of the spiritual blessings, wisdom and prudence. You know, wisdom and prudence dwell together. They go hand in hand. Proverbs 8, 12 says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. 
In Proverbs 16, 21, the wise in heart shall be called prudent. Wisdom and prudence just go together. Uh, prudence, prudent was a word um, George H.W. Bush liked to use a lot. Those of you old enough to remember his presidency wouldn't be prudent, not at this juncture. Um, but uh, prudence is, is something that, uh, that we don't see a lot of in our society. Wisdom is something we don't see a lot of in our society. And if you don't have wisdom, you can't have prudence because they go together. They live together. So if you kick prudence out, you're kicking wisdom out with it. Every parent of teenagers today is staring at me with a look of like, let them have it today, brother. <laughs> I can see it. As I look around at the parents, they're like, yeah. Wisdom is making choices based on God's revealed truth. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about biblical wisdom, applying wisdom in the Christian life. It's making choices based on God's revealed truth. What does the scripture say? Not to trust in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. We make too many decisions based on our own understanding, our, what we think is truth, rather than what God says is truth. Wisdom is facing a situation and applying biblical truths when you make that decision. Wisdom requires you to run your decision-making through the filter of God's Word and, and see what comes out the other side. You know what we like to do? We like to make our decision and then go to God and ask for His stamp of approval on it. That's not how it works. Uh, and sometimes people make decisions and they come to the pastor and want the pastor to put his stamp of approval on it. Sometimes I can't do that because it's not in alignment with God's word, and I have to say, you know, I think you're making a mistake there. Well, I've made up my mind. All right, well, I don't know why you came to talk to me about it. I think you're making a mistake, and when you realize that, come on back. I won't say I told you so. Um, but prudence is very closely related to wisdom. Prudence is thinking through every decision based on the revealed will of God. So wisdom is making choices based on God's revealed truth, and prudence is making decisions based on God's revealed will. So there are some things that are not expressly addressed in the Scripture. I, I think you can make all, the life, all your life's decisions with a biblical principle, even if, the, even if the Bible doesn't have a specific thing for that decision. Uh, you know, should I, buy, should I buy the Honda or should I buy the Toyota? Well, you're not going to find that in the Bible, okay? Um, and uh, maybe God doesn't want you to buy either. So, uh, but there are some decisions that we'll make that you can't go to the Bible and find a yes or no answer. It's not a, it's not a one plus one equals two on every single one of those things. But the major decisions in life that we make, who to marry, when to get married, having children, buying a home, uh, what job should I take, what church should I belong to, these are choices that you can go to God's Word and you can have biblical principles that will guide you to make wise decisions. And in those, those cases where, you know, there's not a clear-cut piece of Scripture that tells me what I should do in this situation, there's always God, but what is your will for my life? And prudence is saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it just isn't, that doesn't fit right with the will of God for my life. It's like having size 10 feet and getting nine and a half shoes. Like, well, there's nothing wrong with nine and a half shoes, is there? Except your feet are tens, and yeah, it's not, it's not going to go as good. I mean, they'll protect your feet, but they'll cause other problems. And so that sometimes we make decisions there's nothing wrong with that per se, but we don't exercise the prudence that comes with wisdom. So, for example, you face a decision about a job offer, uh, something I get asked about a lot. People come and say, Pastor, I got this decision to make about a job. I could do this, could do that. Wisdom means that you're going to consider what the Bible says is right or wrong about the potential job. So is this job going to require me to do things that I know are violate the Word of God? Is this, this job going to require me to lie or to uh, do something immoral or illegal? Am I going to get in business with somebody who doesn't have any morality or ethics about them and they're going to uh, have two sets of books and whatever? And, you know, well, those things are addressed in Scripture. That would make it a very easy no. Yeah, if I take this job, well, I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to fall, fill out tax forms that are wrong and, you know, and I have to lie on this, and sometimes he's going to want me to do it. Well, that's a pretty easy decision. 
That's usually not where people get hung up with. Is this job going to require me to violate what I know to be right according to God's word? Most of the time that answer is no. Most of, most of the folks I pastored never even entertained a job that would cause them to do that. But prudence means that you then consider how that new job will affect what you know to be God's will for your life. So how is this job going to affect my family life? God's will for my life is that I make sure that I take care of my wife's needs. I'm a husband, therefore God's will for my life is to love my wife and provide for her and take care of her. That's God's will for my life. I'm also a father. So it's God's will for my life that I train up my children in the way they should go, that I nurture them and admonish them in the things of the Lord. I give them an example that they can follow. That's God's will for the life of every father. Okay? But I'm also a member of, of Capital City Baptist Church. And I believe God would have me do certain things at Capital City Baptist Church and serve in certain ways and I'm not going to be able to do that if I take this job. Well, God has revealed that he wants you to do these things. This is his will for your life. And unless that's changed, this new thing doesn't fit with what is revealed to be the will of God for your life. Therefore, it's not prudent to take that job, regardless of how much it pays. I have uh, pastor friends of mine will call me and, or you know, other churches will call. They're looking for a pastor that know me, and they'll say, what should we be looking for? What shouldn't we be looking for? Uh, and I, I'll have, a, I'll have a deacons or pulpit committee. They'll say, um, Pastor, if one of the first things the candidate wants to know is how much they're going to get paid, uh, what, what does that mean? I said it means you shouldn't hire him. Because what he gets paid isn't part of the will of God for his life. If the will of God is for him to pastor that church, it doesn't matter what he gets paid. God will take care of his needs. You should pay him what he's worth, for sure. You shouldn't, pastors shouldn't live in the poorhouse just because churches think they should. That's not scriptural, by the way. But at the same time, and uh, Bill's the only member of the pulpit committee that, that's left, but I, we were well into the process of me coming here before money ever came up. In fact, Ron asked me, he's like, you're going to ask what the salary package is? And I said, I assume you'll tell me when we're ready to get to talk about that. As soon as I know it's the will of God for us to come here, we can then talk about that. But that's what wisdom and prudence does. Wisdom is taking what we know to be true in the word of God and, and does this decision, does the word of God rule in or out any of these decisions? And then prudence is saying, well, this is what I know God's will for my life is. Will this decision hurt or hinder God's will for my life? That's how a Christian should make decisions. Now, let me tell you, I've been pastoring for a quarter century. I say it that way because it makes me sound much older than I really am. I have been pastoring most of my life at this point, more, more of my life than not. Um, and one of the most heartbreaking things for me as a pastor that I've seen over 25 years is when people make decisions that are either not wise or not prudent. And they make decisions that hinder the will of God for their life. And down the road, you, you try and tell them in the moment that they, you know, they've got their eyes on the, the glittery things. But then down the road, and they start seeing the erosion of the blessings of God and the Christian life, the abundant life, instead of being overflowing, starts drying up. And they don't know what's wrong. Well, what's wrong is you didn't make a very prudent decision back here. Young people, this is especially important as you decide who you're going to marry, you decide what college you're going to go to, what job you're going to go into, uh, if God's called you into full-time ministry or not. If God's not called you into full-time ministry, don't go into it. You won't last and you'll do more damage than good, by the way. But if God has, you'll be miserable anywhere but in the full-time ministry. I'm just telling you. You'll be miserable anywhere else. Take it from me, I know. God called me as a young man, 14 years old. At 16, I finally surrendered. And the two years in between me saying no and saying yes were the two most miserable years of my life. That's the way it is. I've known pastors who called into the ministry and they made decisions and choices that took them out of the ministry. 
They were imprudent, unwise decisions. And so we're going to talk about wisdom this morning. Because the one thing that will dry up the abundant life quicker than anything else is making decisions outside the will of God for your life. Because the abundant life is the will of God. And wisdom and prudence will direct you to the will of God, funnel you down from all of the possibilities down to the one thing that God really wants for your life. And in that, you will live the abundant life. By the way, that's the picture of the promised land in the Old Testament. The Jews started out as slaves in Egypt, picture of us before we're saved. By the sacrifice of the lamb and the shedding of the blood, the judgment of God passed over them. That's a picture of salvation. They come out of Egypt, which is a picture of the world, go into the wilderness, which is a picture of the early Christian life where we're learning how to worship and serve God. And when we're done learning how to do that properly, then we go into the promised land. That's not a picture of heaven. That's a picture of the abundant life where God wants you, the place God's promised for you and prepared for you and has for you, and you will be happy there if you serve God in that land. And we saw the nation of Israel through that time when they served God and they worshiped God in the promised land, they had peace and prosperity. And when they turned against God and they worshiped idols and they pursued their own agendas, they had nothing but war and trouble and pestilence. Even in the promised land, they were miserable. And so that, that is the picture that is an allegory, the scripture says. It's a, it's a lesson for us. It's illustrating the Christian life right there in full color for us to see. So in verse 8 in Ephesians 1, the Bible says that God has abounded to us, toward us, in all wisdom and prudence. Well, where does wisdom get its start? We're going to jump back to the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to be kind of in Psalms and Proverbs, so if you go to the middle of your Bible, you're going to end up probably right in the Psalms or Proverbs. We'll start with some Proverbs, then we'll jump over to some Psalms. Proverbs is, of course, a book of wisdom. The purpose of the book of Proverbs is to know wisdom and instruction and to perceive the words of understanding, according to verse 2 of the book of Proverbs. Uh, that was the intent. God wanted us to have some wisdom. There's a lot of, a lot of sayings that we still have today, a lot of uh, idioms and things that we use even to this day come from the book of Proverbs because it's timeless wisdom. By the way, God used a man to write the book of Proverbs. We, God blessed him with an inordinate amount of wisdom. He was the wisest man ever to live. But later in his life, he put the wisdom aside and started making some really stupid decisions. He had the wisdom, he just didn't use it. And at the end of his life, God told him, because you've turned your back, because you've built idols and built altars to your, the idols of your foreign wives, and you bowed yourself to them, I'm going to tear the kingdom from you. But not, not all of it, and not in your lifetime, because of the promises I made to your dad, David. And so when Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes the, the throne, the kingdom is split. Judah and Benjamin stay behind. The other ten tribes leave, form the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom worships Baal, worships all kinds of false gods. God eventually sends them off into captivity. Why did that happen? Because Solomon, the wisest man in the world, said, I don't need to use my wisdom. I'll just make my own decisions wisest man in the world, fell. He didn't finish well at all. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 tells us where wisdom gets its start. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Where does wisdom start? It starts by fearing God. In chapter 9, in verse 10, Keep your fingers nimble as we go through Psalms and Proverbs together. Psalm chapter 9, or yeah, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9. And I'll apologize ahead of time. My ears are kind of plugged, so if I'm out in the lobby afterwards and you say something from behind to me and I ignore you, I'm not ignoring you. I probably just didn't hear you. I feel like I'm in a wind tunnel right now with my ears. So I'm just getting through today. I'm reading lips a little bit. 
Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. What does it mean to fear God? It doesn't mean that we cower in fear and we're afraid you know, to say or do anything that God's going to strike us down with. Uh, a lot of people have the, the image of God that he's some kind of cosmic killjoy just sitting up in heaven waiting to zap people. Uh, that's not the biblical view of God. But to have a fear of God is to have a very healthy respect for God. It's kind of like if, if you grew up in a, in a home like I did, it was like when you heard, wait till your dad gets home. It's like, I was not afraid of my dad. My dad's actually a very gentle man. Uh, not afraid of him, but when mom said something like, wait till your dad gets home, it struck fear into me for some reason. And that's what we're talking about. I wasn't afraid of my dad, but I would have never raised a fist to my dad. He'd have put me on the floor. Well, if my mom didn't knock me on the floor first, I was more afraid of my mom. Mom would knock your teeth out. She wasn't afraid of anything or anybody, let me tell you that, except the Lord. But the fear of the Lord is to have a, a healthy respect. I'm, I'm not afraid of God, but I'd be afraid to shake my fist in his face. I'd be afraid to spit in his face. I'd be afraid to say, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it my way. I'd be afraid to do that. that. That is stupid. You know God's never lost in a fight, ever. He just doesn't lose. He can't lose. He doesn't know how to lose because he's all-powerful, and he's, he knows everything. So in Psalm chapter 2, when the Bible says, talking about the battle of Armageddon, when the armies of the earth gather together to do battle, and you can imagine millions of soldiers streaming into the valley of Armageddon, and they're all pointing their guns and their missiles at Jesus riding back in the clouds on his white charger. You know what Psalm 2 says God's going to do at that moment? He's going to laugh. <laughs> They're pointing guns at us. Nuclear missiles. Oh, no, what are we going to do? It's a nuclear missile. You know, the Bible says it's going to happen in the Battle of Armageddon. The Lord's going to open his mouth. The Lord Jesus is going to open his mouth. The sword's going to come out, and the battle's going to be over before it even starts. The Bible says the blood will run to the horse's bridle. The Bible says for six months into the millennial kingdom, we'll still be burying the dead from that event. They're going to gather all their weapons together. They're going to point them at the Messiah, and he's just going to open his mouth, and the battle will be over. Psalm 119, verse 38 says, Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. We get, we get wisdom what motivates me to want to make good decisions? Well, there's a God in heaven who's watching everything that I do. And, yeah, he's not going to let me do what I want to do. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is a God of love, and he is my father, and I, I love him, and I'm thankful for my salvation, and I'm not afraid of him, but I need to have such a tremendous respect for him that it affects everything that I do. Growing up, I wasn't just Jerry's son when I was at home. I was Jerry's son when I went out in public. And Jerry and Sandy had some rules about how their children were supposed to behave, whether they were at home or in public. And it didn't matter if they were there or not there. They would always somehow find out almost everything that I ever did. There's a couple things. I'll wait till my dad's deathbed and I'll say, hey, Dad, one, one thing I need to confess. But they know most of it. The fear of God is what starts wisdom. And, you know, to be saved, you have to have a fear of God. 
To be saved, you have to say, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that my sin has separated me from a holy God. And I recognize that God sent his only begotten son to die on a cross and shed his blood for my sin. And, and you have such respect for that that you say, I choose to believe that and I choose to receive the salvation that God has offered. That's, that's what it takes. Just, just pray in this prayer, repeat after me. That doesn't get you to heaven. It's when you realize what God has done for you and you receive it that you get saved. A proper fear of the Lord is going to get me into God's word. Uh, you're in Proverbs there. Look at chapter 10 and verse 8. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. What do the wise do? They receive commandments. Back in chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. In Proverbs 18, 15, the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. In Proverbs 21, 11, when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. The Bible in Proverbs, if you read through Proverbs, it talks about a wise person hears instruction. A wise person receives the commandments. A wise person listens for direction from people who know what they're doing. The problem when you're 13 or 15 or 17 or maybe even 20, the problem is you think you're smarter than you are. And people who've grown up and lived through that process and made the dumb mistakes that you're making and have learned from them, they, they want to impart to you wisdom and they want to impart to you instruction and they want to say, don't do this and do this. And a wise young person is going to listen to those older folks who've learned and, and made those mistakes, have the scars to prove it. They don't do what I did. But you can also glean wisdom from those who were smart enough to avoid some of those mistakes. I'm so glad I didn't do that when I was a teenager. I'm so glad I didn't uh, mess up there. Something that we deal with in our society today. Can I just say, I am glad that I took my purity to my wedding night. That's not, not something I've ever regretted. My wife is the only woman I've ever known. It's a blessing. And young people, you'd be wise to take your purity to your wedding night. You will never say to me as your pastor, man, I regret being pure until my wedding night. You will never say that to me. By the way, I've never had anybody ever say to me, boy, I regret not starting to drink alcohol or not starting to smoke cigarettes or not starting to smoke pot or do drugs. I've never had anyone regret any of those things. But I've preached in prisons where they line up to tell me, yeah, I got into drugs. I, I, had the, I had bad friends, got me started into alcohol, got me started into drugs, got me started into pornography. I'm here in prison now because I listened to my friends and not my Sunday school teacher and my grandma and my mom and whoever else was trying to tell me not to do those things. Don't go that way. They tried to warn me. I didn't listen. I've preached in prisons with a line of men telling me the same story over and over and if I can find it, I've got a letter written by a man who was in one of those prisons, and he wrote me a letter, and he said, read this letter to your youth group, which I did at the time. If I can find it, I'll pull it out, give it to Brian. He can read it to our teenagers now. Written from a man who wished he had listened to the things that we're telling him. Never heard anybody regret getting saved. Never met the person who said, man, I regret trusting Christ as my Savior. Never yet. I've never met the person who said, I really regret surrendering my life to God, whether it was to go into full-time ministry or whether it was to be a lawyer or whether, whatever it was that God called them to be. And he said, I just said, Lord, whatever you want me to be, that's what I'll do. I've never yet heard anybody say, man, I regret that. But I know a hundred people that said, Pastor, I regret that when God was speaking to me, I didn't listen. I did my own thing. Proper fear of the Lord is going to get you into God's Word. If I really am worried about what God thinks, and if I'm really worried that God is not going to bless my life if I don't do what He wants, and if I'm really worried that there's going to be negative consequences, it would, it would be wise then if I fear God or respect Him properly that I get into His Word because these are the instructions. Everything you need to know about pleasing God is right here in these pages. Everything. 
So if I'm really worried about what God thinks, what am I going to do? Get in his word. Come to church. I'll preach it for you. I'll explain it to you. The purpose of the preaching of the word of God is to give you the sense of what it means, to help you understand what's in there. But I'd get in the Bible and start reading uh, anytime. You know, reading a proverb a day is a great thing to do. So today's what? The 10th? Uh, start in Proverbs 10. Today's the 10th. Read that one. There's 31 Proverbs. Some months have 31. You know, in those 30 day months, you'll have to read two chapters at the end of the month. I'm sorry to bear the bad news. Two whole chapters. In February, man, you got to read like half the book of Proverbs in one day because it's only 28. I should get off easy with a leap year, but you know, read a psalm a day or a proverb a day, a chapter of Proverbs a day. Just read them over and over. Do that for an entire year and see if you don't start picking up things from Proverbs that will fix things in your life. You know? How, how do I avoid financial trouble? Well, the Bible gives you great advice on that. Don't get into debt. Don't get into debt. Don't use credit cards to pay for things you don't have the money for. That's, Bible says, the borrower is servant to the lender. Don't get into debt. You got saved, your debt was paid. Your spiritual debt was paid. Why go into financial debt? Live debt free. Now, I think a mortgage is a little different because um, there's an asset there behind it. And a car can be the same way, but you got to be wise about it. You know, if you make $25,000 a year, don't buy a $25,000 car. Buy the kind of cars that I've driven all my life, half of which were given to me uh, over time. I can't tell you how many cars have been given to me. Um, some I loved and some went up in flames, literally, on the side of the road. But God's been good. I never, never, never had a problem. Here's what God's word will do for me. It'll keep me from sin. Look at Psalm 119. Longest, if you want to call it a chapter. It's not really a chapter, it's a song. Read Psalm 119 every day. That'll get your attention. 176 verses. You'll be wishing you're only reading a proverb a day at that point. By the way, if you don't, don't know, uh, you know, you haven't spent a lot of time reading the Bible. Uh, it was a famous atheist, um, and at the later in his life, I guess he became more of a deist. He believed that there was a God that wasn't necessarily, you know, aligned with any particular religion or anything like that. Uh, but he read the Bible, and then he read the Koran, and uh, somebody asked him, you know, well, what was it like reading the Bible in the Koran? And he said, reading the Bible was like reading the, the pinnacle of, of the English language, the highest literary achievement of, uh, that could be possible. And he said, reading the Koran was like doing penance. Um, if you've ever tried to read the Koran, it's, it's a mess. Uh, I'm thankful for my Bible. Psalm 119, look at verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How do you cleanse your way, young man? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Get in the word of God. The word of God's going to clean you up. Only if you do it. Look at verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against thee. The more of God's word you get into you, the more of sin will get out of you. Uh, the old saying goes, the book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the book. If you look at verse 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Look at verse 133. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Look at verse 158. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. There is over and over and over again in this chapter a correlation given between being in the word of God, learning the word of God, and living the right kind of life. Where does 
wisdom starts, starts with a proper respect for God, which then gets us into his word, which then gets the sin out of our life. It stops us from making foolish decisions. So let's talk about wisdom applied now for just a second. The Bible says if we lack wisdom, there's a procedure. It's a really complicated procedure, so listen very closely. If we as believers ever lack wisdom in what to do in a situation, then what we have to do is, step one, ask God what to do. And that's the end of the process. See? It's real complicated. James chapter 1, verse... Uh, verse uh, 5, or is it two verse, chapter 2, verse 5? Um, no, it's chapter 1, verse 5 in James. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You lack wisdom. God, I, I just don't know what to do. I've been studying, I've been looking, I've been reading your word, I've been trying to find an answer. Lord, I don't know what to do. You know what the Bible says? He will give you the answer. And if he doesn't give you the answer right now, don't make the decision right now. You know, Saul got in trouble for doing that. The Philistines were gathering on the other side of the hill, and he was standing there with the armies of Israel, and King Saul said, I don't know where Samuel is. He's late. Well, I'm going to go ahead and offer the sacrifice. Well, when Samuel showed up and he was finishing up offering the sacrifice, Samuel said, what are you doing well, you were late. No, I'm right on time. I represent God. You don't. And God called Saul a rebellious king. And he said, Samuel said to Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What was Saul doing? He was offering a sacrifice to God. That doesn't sound very rebellious. Yeah, but it wasn't what he was supposed to do. It was against the revealed truth of God's word and the revealed will of God for his life. He was the king, not the high priest. And it was the priest's job to offer the sacrifice. What did Saul do? He said, eh, I'll do it my way. Don't get ahead of God. You'll regret it every time. The best thing that you can do is walk side by side with the Lord. He goes with us everywhere we go. Sometimes we need to get behind him, hide behind him when Satan comes, and say, ha, ha, deal with Dad but you never want to get in front of him. Never want to get in front of him. So what do we do when we lack wisdom? Step one is ask God for wisdom. What's step two? There's no step two. You ask, be quiet, listen. He'll tell you. He will. The Bible says it shall be given him. If anybody ever asks God for wisdom and he doesn't give it, then God's a liar. It's just that simple. We have biblical examples of wisdom at work. You think about Joseph living in Egypt as a slave. Man, he was a wise young man. As a slave in Potiphar's house, he dealt wisely with all the affairs and got promoted to the chief steward of Potiphar's house. When he got falsely accused and thrown into prison, he behaved himself wisely when he was in prison. Wisdom and prudence, knowing what God's truth is, he didn't quite understand all of what God's will was, so he just had to fall back on what he knew God's truth was. And he behaved himself wisely. He got promoted in the prison. Eventually, God put him in the place where he was standing before Pharaoh, telling Pharaoh his dream, and Pharaoh makes him the second most powerful man in the world. Because not only could Joseph tell Pharaoh what his dream meant, but he could tell him what to do about it. Because God gave him the wisdom. And when Pharaoh wanted to honor Joseph, Joseph said, it's not me, it's God. God gave me the vision. God gave me the answers. What about David when Saul was chasing him? The Bible says David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. David didn't turn around and attack King Saul. David just said, Saul is God's problem. I'm going to let Saul, God deal with Saul. And David just kept staying out of his way and staying out of his way. And two times he could have killed Saul if he wanted to. One time he snuck into his camp, took his spear, took his cloak, and he got to the other side to safety and he said, hey, you guys are sleeping over there. If I wanted to kill Saul, I could have. I'm not his enemy. What about Joshua and fighting in the promised land? Behave wisely. You know why? Because he just did what God told him to do. 
March around the city seven times. That sounds stupid, but it works. Blow the trumpets. Walls will come down. It worked. Every time God told Joshua, go do this, and Joshua did it, it worked. What about Samuel leading the nation of Israel into revival? Samuel is a very wise man because he followed what God told him to do. You know, God has a plan for your life. It's not just the revealed truth of his word, but there is a specific will God has for your life. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul wrote this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. In the day you got saved, God started something in you that he's going to keep finishing until you see him face to face. He's got a plan for your life in particular. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, where we were a moment ago, where he's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. God just has a way of making his will known to you. Sometimes people will say, Pastor, how did you know you were called to preach? And my answer is the same. I just knew. Clear as a bell. Pastor, how did you know that you were going to marry Chris? I just knew. I had prayed for years. I'd ask God for wisdom. I, I said, God, I just, when she walks in the room, I just want to know it's her. When she walked into the room, the Holy Spirit said, that's her. I said, Sam, I'm going to marry that girl. He said, you don't even know her name. I said, Mrs. Dalkey. <laughs> How did I know that God wanted me to pastor Fallsburg Baptist Church? I just knew. Second, time, second Sunday we were there, I just knew. I, did God, I know God wanted me to come here and pastor Capital City Baptist Church. I just know. I'm sure of it as I am that the lights are on in this room. I'm sure. There's no question about it in my mind. And I'm, even, even this year, being with all the building garbage going on and different situations that have come up this year, uh, I am fulfilled. I'm at peace. I know God has a plan for this church. I'm looking forward to being a part of it. And I don't want to get ahead of God. Let me share you a silly example of this. It goes right to the heart of this message. The Lord laid on my heart to start praying that we get rid of that dirt pile. And not only does it not cost us anything to get rid of it, but that they, somebody will pay us some money for it. God told me to start praying. I've asked you to pray for that. Well, I got a call on Friday from our site contractor, and he said, I've got somebody on the line. Uh, they're, they're willing to, uh, they're willing to you know, take it. They really don't want to pay for the hauling or any of that. It's going to cost about $11,000 to haul it to their site you know, and stuff. And, and I, my first reaction was, we'll see if they'll just pay half and you know, I'm start that. And then we got to the men's conference, and the first message was, was on, I forget it was even on, but the, the Lord used one of the verses that the preacher was talking about. And he said, I didn't tell you to pray for you to only pay half of the moving of that dirt. I told you to pray that I would move that dirt and pay you for it. And I said, okay, well, we're not going to pay to move that dirt then. It'll sit there until you move that pile of dirt and give us some money for it. And so the answer is no, we're not, we're not going to pay we're not going to pay five or six thousand dollars to move that dirt. Just not going to do it. Why? It's not the will of God for us. I, I don't think we should spend six thousand of the Lord's money, money that people have donated. It's the Lord's money. I don't think we should pay that to move a pile of dirt. God said He's willing to move and pay us for when it gets moved. You say, Pastor, that sounds kind of silly. Yeah, but that pile of dirt's going to sit there until somebody writes us a check for it. And I'm praying God, would, in his time, will send the right buyer. Is it the will of God for that pile of dirt to be moved? Yes. Is it his will for the pile of dirt to be moved today? No, because we don't have the buyer today that will buy it and haul it away. That's how the will of God works. I'm sure we shouldn't pay any money 
to me that pile of dirt. I'm sure. I hope you'll join me in prayer. Because when that pile of dirt moves and somebody writes us a check, you're going to say, wow, look at what God did. Maybe pastor's not a moron after all. Maybe he does actually hear from God from time to time. And I'm telling you this knowing that a year from now, if that pile of dirt's still sitting there, I'm going to look stupid. But I just don't think God's going to let me down. I just don't think he's going to let me down. He's never failed me yet. I don't think he's going to fail me now. We short-circuit the will of God for our life. We dry up the abundant life when we make imprudent and unwise decisions. You have all the wisdom you need. And when you need a little more, just ask. You'll get it. Let's stand together for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity to honor those who have served our country honorably in the military and Again, we're thankful for their sacrifice. Lord,